Our next speaker is Dr. Monty Thompson, a long-term investigator here in Atlanta, the principal investigator of the AIDS Research, not the AIDS Research Consortium, my brain is, of ARCA, the AIDS Research Consortium of Atlanta. And she is going to talk to us today about frailty, screening, preventing, and intervening. So Melanie? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, it is great to be here today, seeing real live faces in front of me, and, uh, and thanks to all the hundreds of people who are attending virtually. Uh, here are my disclosures. And I hope at the end of this talk, you'll be able to identify some tools for assessing frailty, uh, implement strategies to prevent and mitigate frailty, uh, and address the pesky issue of polypharmacy. <clears throat> Sorry, it sounds like I have my, um, I forgot to take my loratadine voice this morning. So this is the other title of my talk. Um, Everybody loves to hear about new screening tools, right? Because we don't have enough to do in the 15 to 20 minutes we see people in the office. So I, I hope that you know you will will find that the, some of the tools are not as hard as uh, as we think, and also that this is something that's actually worthwhile to do. So frailty has a lot of definitions. It can be described as a state of depleted reserve where the stressors that occur uh, really result in increasing numbers of adverse outcomes ranging from dependency to death. And we usually think about um, that in this sort of fashion with the staccato decrease in function. Uh, and I think the good news is that we can sometimes mitigate this decline. And the better news is we can sometimes turn it around either partially or fully. And, and so why is frailty this new buzzword in HIV care? Well, in many ways, the answer is pretty obvious. So we know that people are living longer and, and really within about nine years of the lifespan of people without HIV. But the problem is that people with HIV experience comorbidities and accumulate comorbidities about 10 years earlier than people without HIV. And this is especially true for women. I shout out Lauren Collins from the Emory group of the combined Max Wise cohort. So we see more comorbidities in women uh, and they occur early. And this is a striking slide to me when I saw this. Um, the women less than 25 years old had the greatest difference between HIV positive, HIV negative women in terms of their accumulation of comorbidities. So, you know, just because somebody's not 65, uh, you don't have, don't forget that they may be accumulating comorbidities. Frailty also occurs more frequently and earlier in people with HIV. Uh, and even at the young age of 45 to 50, the percent of people who are frail or pre-frail frail, uh, is only about a third in people without HIV, but more than a half in people who have HIV. And this is according to the Age HIV cohort study in Amsterdam. We think about comorbidities basically leading to frailty, but it works the other way too. Uh, this is a, an analysis that showed that frailty is an independent risk factor, not only for mortality, almost fourfold for mortality, but also almost fourfold for incident cardiovascular disease and over twofold for the development of diabetes. And, and so let's talk about some of these tools for frailty assessment. Now, this may be one that you're not familiar with. Um, it is a Canadian scale called the Clinical Frailty Scale. And I like this because uh, it turns out I think I've been doing this for a long time. And you probably have too, but now we can be more conscious about it. This is a clinical judgment tool. 
It was validated in people 65 years and older in a large Canadian cohort. But it turns out in this continuum of uh, frailty, uh, reaching a CFS score of four was really where very mild frailty began. And this is a place where people aren't dependent on others for their daily activities, but they all, they're beginning to have symptoms that are limiting their activities a little bit. And they complain of vague things like, oh, I'm just slowing down. I just can't do what I used to do. Um, and I get tired in the daytime. Obviously, we need to look for causes of that. But th these can be early signs of frailty. Um, I like the SPPB uh, battery because it is performance based. It's also easy. There are just three physical tasks. One is to do uh, standing after sitting in a chair five times, and that's timed. And then to do a timed walk of three or four meters. And then balance tests. So standing balance tests, 10 seconds, and you can see the patterns here side by side, semi tandem, tandem. Um, and it turns out that a score of less than 10 is associated with a higher risk of death. And these are really pretty fast tests. And I actually had a patient say to me the other day, after I'd had him do the, the stands, you know, you do a wonderful physical exam. And I'm like, wow, I didn't do anything different. And it's like, but nobody's ever made me stand up before after being in a chair. So, you know, patients like this stuff. Um, so here's the gold standard, if you will, frailty study from 2001. Um, Linda Freed uh, described a phenotype, and these are the five characteristics uh, that indicate frailty. Uh, weight loss, self-reported exhaustion, low energy expenditure, sort of sedentary lifestyle. Um, slow gait speed is uh, timed, and that's a very important indicator, very sensitive and weak grip strength. And this is also a very sensitive indicator. The problem is it requires a tool, a dynamometer. And uh, you can get one for $29.95 on the Home Shopping Network, but actually what is generally used in clinical trials and by people who do this is a little bit more expensive. Also has to be calibrated once a year. But here's some good news. This business about gait speed can actually be very important. It's highly sensitive. And if you do a walk over four meters, could be three meters, and you want to calculate the gait speed according to meters per second, it, this really identifies people who are at risk of adverse outcomes. And it predicts disability, but also cognitive impairment, institutionalization, falls, and mortality. So here's a pretty easy single item tool. Uh, there are some other frailty screeners. There are a lot of frailty indices, and these are deficit accumulation models. And basically, uh, there are many variables, most of which are questionnaire-based variables. So you could do that on a tablet or something like that. Uh, some incorporate some physical variables. Um, I'll also mention the VAX index, Veterans Aging Cohort Study. Uh, this is a very powerful tool that predicts five-year mortality in people with HIV. And these are very simple va variables, most of which are lab-based. They're not all lab-based. Somebody might ask you a question about that. Um, but age, sex, and BMI are the only things that are not lab-based. And so this can be a very powerful tool. And when I think about prevention and intervention, I, I think we're really talking about two sides of the same coin. Um, there is another paper by Linda Freed, the guru of Freed Phenotypes, uh, in 2021, in which she described principles for preventing and intervening uh, with frailty. First of all, to minimize the aggregating factors that lead to frailty. Secondly, to increase the protective factors. And in terms of these aggregating factors, it turns out that maintaining access to routine health care is really important. And this is something that we've seen disrupted in the past few years for many people. But this is where we address these age-related deficits, vision, hearing, dentition, but also routine cancer screening, routine vaccinations, STI screening. And also, it's where we screen and prevent and manage 
comorbidities. And that includes mental health and substance use. And I always want to just remind people that these are comorbidities too and require screening and intervention. Also, polypharmacy and falls are very important components, and we'll talk about them. The things we can do to promote health include increasing physical activity and also social interaction, which also has been extremely uh, disrupted in the last couple of years. So I want to point out this scientific statement from the American Heart Association from 2019. So the cardiologists actually uh, did a statement about people with HIV because they recognized the higher risk. And it turns out that people with HIV have one and a half to two-fold higher risk for myocardial infarctions, for strokes, for heart failure, but also they have higher rates of pulmonary hypertension, blood clots, and sudden death. And they identified these HIV-related cardiovascular disease risk-enhancing factors. And basically, these are things that put people at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. They are common. They include prolonged viremia, either starting antiretrovirals late or falling out of care, stopping taking their drugs, uh, non-adherence. Uh, also, at any time, a CD4 count of less than 350. Uh, also, metabolic syndrome, lipodystrophy, and fatty liver disease emerges more and more as an important risk factor, uh, along with hepatitis C co-infection. And so if, if any of these are present, then they tell us to consider adjusting our risk scores up by one and a half to twofold. In terms of screening for cardiovascular disease, um, I'll say the obvious, smoking, we really have to, to work on this. Uh, and then the usual risk factors, uh, reminding you that we diagnose uh, diabetes using plasma glucose, not hemoglobin A1C. Uh, and then other screening tools are pretty simple. Um, BMI it really correlates with increased risk for hypertension and diabetes, and again, fatty liver disease. Waist circumference is associated with visceral fat and it predicts diabetes, MI, frailty, and death. And you can actually fine tune this a little bit uh, by categorizing people into different BMI strata and by using uh, gender, which unfortunately here is uh, binary. And I, I wanna mention coronary artery calcium scores. I'm using these more and more. Um, and they do predict uh, uh, cardiovascular events. Um, but it's also true that people with HIV have higher coronary calcium scores than age-matched people without HIV. And whereas they can have non-calcified plaque, this is a very important and I think useful tool uh, for people with HIV. So we have other common comorbidities that we want to screen and intervene. Uh, about uh, liver disease I mentioned. Um, just to also mention that for fatty liver, there's a, a good little algorithm in the European uh, HIV AIDS guidelines that walks you through uh, working up fatty liver. Uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis with DEXA scans, uh, and addressing the modifiable risk factors there or there and looking for secondary causes, always very important. Uh, again, I'll mention depression. Screening with the PHQ-2 or 9 is actually pretty easy, and it's also reimbursable. There's a code for that. Um, and we also want to screen for substance use, alcohol, don't forget alcohol, uh, pain meds, and then non-prescription drugs. I'll say a word about screening for cognitive impairment in older adults. It's a much longer discussion. But the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force released a recommendation statement. Now, this is general population from 2020. And it turns out our old friend, the Mini Mental Status Exam, was the most evaluated instrument in about 30 studies, and that this is very sensitive and specific for detecting dementia. But it also turns out that there was not a single study that had high specificity and high sensitivity for identifying mild cognitive impairment. So there is no single tool, and it turns out that this requires a little more complicated exam. 
But here's some good news. You know all those brain games uh, on the internet that some of you probably do? Uh, a meta-analysis showed that in randomized control trials, these brain games can actually improve physical and cognitive function for people living with HIV. And so uh, in this meta-analysis, they found significant improvement in a number of domains, um, including memory uh, and including daily function. So I think this is a very positive um, aspect. Now let's talk about polypharmacy for a minute. Polypharmacy, what is it? What's bad about it? Well, it's defined as five or more drugs. But how many of our patients have hyperpolypharmacy, 10 or more drugs? I know I have a lot of those. Um, polypharmacy is driven by multimorbidity. And there are things that are associated with polypharmacy that, that really are bad outcomes. And I would point you to the graph uh, in the, the right lower uh, quadrant showing that in a study of older adults with HIV, over 90% had polypharmacy. And if you took away their HIV drugs, still over 70% defined as high, uh, polypharmacy. But really, another 70% had drug-drug interactions that were associated with polypharmacy. And so we see more drug-associated adverse effects, more drug interactions. And in this cohort, 50% of people were actually on inappropriate drugs. We also see prescribing cascades. So people have a problem. The drug causes side effects. We add another drug to counteract the side effects, and it keeps going on. So this is a cause of polypharmacy. And then, of course, missed doses, missed refills, and overall increased cost, which is more and more and more a problem for our patients. So the management of polypharmacy, here's the bad news. Um, you really should go through the medication list at every visit, uh, but especially after hospitalizations and after consults, because people often have new drugs. They may not know the names of their drugs, but they often have new drugs, and sometimes consultants are not aware of, of the kind of drug interactions that we know so well. And what we want to look for are new or unnecessary drugs. We want to look for wrong doses and wrong durations of drugs. And this includes over-the-counter drugs also. Prescribing cascades, overlapping toxicities, and intrinsic toxicities of the drugs. And then these drug-drug interactions. And, and I always say, don't guess about this. Look it up. You know, the Liverpool Drug Interaction website is awesome. And these are surprising sometimes. Remember alcohol, other recreational substances, and again, over-the-counter drugs, they play into this mix too. And I've... Um, identified on the citations for this slide some helpful to tools, which are the stop and start screeners for looking at drugs, and the Beers criteria from the American Geriatric Society that goes through a lot of these inappropriate drugs. They're, they're very helpful. This is an interesting study presented at CROI about anticholinergic medications and their association with falls and frailty in people with HIV. And this is from the poppy cohort, people 50 years and older in the UK uh, with HIV. And so this is an analysis of about 700 uh, people in the poppy cohort. Uh, they were disproportionately male and white, unfortunately. But in this cohort, 9% reported recurrent falls and almost a third met frailty criteria. So uh, an interesting group. And then here are the most common drugs with anticholinergic side effects that were prescribed. And some of these are kind of no-brainers, but this also reminds us that some of the drugs we don't think of as anticholinergic actually may have some anticholinergic effect, and that may be magnet, uh, magnified in older people. And it turns out that the number of anticholinergic medications has an association with recurrent falls and also frailty. So two or more anticholinergic medications 
strongly associated with recurrent falls and also frailty. And talking about falls, it is something uh, that we really shouldn't take for granted. We should ask more about falls uh, because we can prevent falls. And this is actually a helpful uh, website from the CDC called the Steady uh, Algorithm. And you can download this uh, chart from that website. It starts with asking three questions. Do you feel unsteady when you're standing or walking? Are you worried about falling? And have you fallen in the past year? And if any of those answers is yes, then it takes you to the second column, which gives you more intensive screening, and then to the third column, which is about intervention, the things we can do to prevent falls. And here's something else we can do to prevent falls. So I think this is a hopeful thing as well. It turns out that balance exercises actually do um, work. And of all the different exercises that were studied in this um, systematic review and meta-analysis, resistance exercises, aerobic exercises, they didn't do anything to improve balance. But balance exercises were very targeted and very effective. So uh, I think this is a, a hopeful thing and something that we should probably think about uh, even at younger ages before people are beginning to have um, significant trouble with balance. So can physical activity decrease or prevent frailty? Well, the answer seems to be yes. Uh, on the left, you see an analysis from Singapore of a general population of people who were 65 years old or older who were pre-frail or frail, and they were randomized to a control group or um, three different interventions, nutrition, cognition interventions, or physical interventions, and then there was a fourth group that included all of the above. And it turns out that after 24 weeks of this intervention, um, everybody had some improvement in their frailty scores, but the people who improved the most and who had the most sustained improvement were the people who were randomized to physical activity, uh, either alone or in a combination. So I think that is very encouraging. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see um, Christine Erlinson's work on an HIV-specific population compared to people without HIV, and it turns out that um, for 20, people who were engaged in 24 weeks of physical activity actually improved um, at least as well as people without HIV and often better, and they started at a lower point in general. And so this was a mix of different activities, um, and I've highlighted there three of them that you'll recognize as being associated with frailty indices, uh, chair stand time, uh, the walk time, uh, this one's 400 meters, and grip strength. And so these are very important indicators of frailty, and, and they all improved. And I would also point out at the bottom, um, people with HIV improved their oxygen capacity more than people without HIV. So, so it's really important that uh, we encourage exercise. So we all hope that maybe technology will save the day, don't we, in one way or another? Um, and there are people who are studying devices and very, uh, a variety of interventions to see if they can impact frailty uh, or falls or other variables. And so um, I don't really read the Journal of Medical Internet Research, but I discovered it uh, in, in looking at studies that were being done. Uh, and I've listed a couple of those here. And there was also a recent study uh, that was published in JAMA that looked at using tablets for questionnaires. And, you know, it turns out that actually people liked using tablets and that they, uh, they were probably more honest using tablets to answer certain questions. And I think using a, a tablet or, you know, an electronic questionnaire of some sort uh, could actually be helpful, save time in the office and so on. It turns out, I found out the other day um, as I was preparing for this talk, 
that all this time, my iPhone has been tracking my walking steadiness. And maybe yours has too. So it turns out there is a metric for walking steadiness that is built into the health app in iPhones. And it will give you a grade on your walking steadiness. And it also will notify you if you are having problems with walking steadiness. And it turns out that it's also been tracking my step length, my walking speed, my double support time, the time I stand on two feet, um, and my walking asymmetry. And it gives me exercises that I can do to improve my walking steadiness. And, you know, I thought this was really kind of cool because, honestly, one of the things that I think about frailty and have learned about frailty is that people don't want to be frail. And older people don't want to be disabled. And, and they're, actually, they're very interested in doing things that can help them. And yesterday in my office, um, a 75-year-old man came in with a new Apple Watch. And his son had bought him the Apple Watch. And he was so excited about the different things he could do with his watch and, you know, track the number of steps that he made um, and check his heart rate and things like this. And, you know, it really struck me. Um, I thought this was cool about walking steadiness, so I showed it to him. Uh, and, and he was excited about that. But I think if we can identify tools that people can use in their daily lives, uh, many people will use them. Because honestly, who wants to be bedridden? Who wants to be not able to walk? Who wants to fall? Um, nobody. So I do think enlisting the patients in some of this um, makes it a less daunting task. Um, and I think they also appreciate it very much. And so I'll come back to uh, the beginning of the talk and just say that um, there are a lot of things we can do to minimize these factors that lead to frailty, um, particularly early management of potential comorbidities and existing comorbidities, keeping people in routine health care. How many people have you seen recently who haven't been in the office for a year? or who didn't get their colonoscopy, or their mammogram, or you know, other routine screenings. How many people are behind on their vaccinations? I, I think COVID gives us an opportunity to actually look back and see how many missed opportunities there have been, um, and to reinforce the importance of staying in care. Uh, so um, you know, the other point I would make is, in terms of promoting health and resiliency, I didn't really show you data this time about social interactions, but it turns out social isolation is associated with mortality. And it's really important that we identify um, the, the interaction and the isolation that people are experiencing and have experienced, particularly during COVID, and, and maybe make some uh, suggestions for, for how to mitigate that. You know, now that people are out moving around more, seeing people more, that's a great thing. Uh, but I also have had a number of patients who have gotten a lot of benefit from online engagement. And as much as some of us hate Zoom because we've been doing it for meetings and meetings and meetings, there are plenty of people who really have enjoyed that. And so teaching people some ways to stay in touch with others and to interact with others and simple phone calls and so on can, can really go a long way. So I think the bottom line of this talk is whatever you choose to do, whatever fits with your practice in terms of assessing frailty, um, What's really important is that we start thinking about it. So that we start thinking about frailty in people who are older and at risk, and also thinking about it in our younger people um, who we don't want to go down that road. And it turns out that we've done a pretty good job of helping people live longer lives. Perhaps we've done a less good job at helping them lead quality lives um, and lives with enjoyment. And this is where I think the frailty piece fits in. 
And I want to thank all the people who contributed to this talk today, the patients, my colleagues, and also specifically my patients, um, some of whom uh, I've been seeing for 35 years um, and who have taught me about growing older with resilience and grace. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mani. Um, I really valued your talk. That this is something we as primary care providers are all struggling with, how to do a better job in all these various metrics. And one of the questions I have is, which ones can only a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA do? Of all these things that you proposed, is this something that we need to be doing? Or do we have to design our systems better to allow the patients and others to do them at appropriate times? You know, I think that's a great question, particularly because our workforce is struggling. And, you know, clinicians, I, I won't go on, on that soapbox, but I have one um, about workforce. And, and I do think that almost all of these things can be done by somebody else. You know, you don't have to have a medical degree to time somebody doing, you know, a three meter, four meter walk. Um, you know, I do some of these things in the exam room, like the chair sits, because people are generally sitting in a chair anyway. Uh, but I think that, that really almost all of these things can be done by other people. And, you know, as though, although we like to think as physicians um, and nurse practitioners and PAs who are the primary care providers, um, for our patients, often the patients have very strong and maybe stronger relationships with other people in the office. So, you know, there, there may be somebody else in the office um, that they spend more time with than they spend with us or, you know. So I think using staff that you have, and many staff actually like doing these things, it gives them something different to do. Um, I recognize we are all crunched for our time. Uh, but I think we can pick out some pivotal things that can be done and be helpful. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to have people do a lot of these at home and it'll mm -hmm. be integrated into the EHR, right? So that, right, yeah. and that's not that far in the future. Some of these things can be done now and, are, and will feed into EHRs. Well, yeah, that's right. And um, I, I have to say my practice just transitioned to EPIC. Um, which I won't really go down that road very far because it's been really interesting. But I have learned a lot about um, the capabilities of a big program like EPIC. And even though it's a very busy program, it's way too busy, there's way too much stuff in there. But there are some things that actually could be done with that platform that I think would be very helpful in this regard. Um, and, and I also like the idea of people doing things at home, online, uh, or remotely. Some of these things can be done in telemedicine. And, you know, I think patients can do a lot of these things on their own and, um, and not take up time in the office. One question that arose from the audience, if, if you're not used to doing gate speed, it sounds simple, but what do you tell the patient? Do you tell them walk as fast as you can or walk your normal pace or be careful walking down the hall? I mean, what instructions do you give them? Yeah, so um, two points here. One is that um, there are some nuances. Different frailty scales do different things with gate speed. And so if you're, if you're interested in this and it's something you might want to do, then I would encourage you to read some of the original papers, the, the freed phenotype paper and so on. Some of these um, will make a, an adjustment in the calculation according to height or weight or whatever. But you know, generally, what you tell people is just walk your normal pace. So just walk your normal pace for this length and you can have them do it a couple of times, um, but it's not a race. It's not how fast can you do this? It's sort of what is normal. And you know, sometimes you, you see people walking in the office, you can almost mentally <laughs> do it when you see them walk across the, the floor in the office. But you know, that's the kind of thing that you want them to do, just a normal pace. Okay. Another question, you mentioned, you know, NAFLD and NASH, and this is something that is becoming increasingly common, mm -hmm. especially in this era of obesity. And one of the questions is, what do you do when you diagnose somebody? And 
you know, you've recommended diet and exercise. Are there any pharmacologic interventions that have been shown to be beneficial? Um, well, it's a little beyond the scope of this talk, but um, there isn't anything that's approved yet for treating fatty liver disease. So I'll mention that there are a number of things that have been uh, tried and are in clinical trials. Um, even our, our uh, one of our old friends uh, that was a, a CCR5 inhibitor uh, years ago was tried for fatty liver disease. You know, I think um, there is some promise in using drugs like semaglutide. Um, again, not approved, but there are some data uh, on using those sorts of drugs for um, decreasing fatty liver disease. Um, you know, what I kind of use the diagnosis, first of all, make the diagnosis. I think that's the first thing. You see some elevated liver enzymes. Um, you know, if they are persistent, then I think send the patient for an ultrasound. Let's see what's going on with the liver. Um, and, you know, if they don't have evidence of serious liver disease, uh, I think it's a, it's a teaching mechanism. I actually, two days ago, I had a patient who was just very upset because the scan that he had had uh, for another reason identified fat, fatty liver. And he was horrified, you know, he's a trim guy, goes to the gym all the time. He's like, how can I have a fat liver? Um, and, but I think it, it is an opportunity to talk to people about doing the things they can do. And right now, I think diet, exercise are the main important things that people can do. Watching alcohol consumption and other things that can interfere with the liver because um, even though uh, most cases of fatty liver are not gonna progress to cirrhosis, you can heap things on top of already existing conditions and make things worse. So it's an opportunity to talk about moderation in terms of alcohol and that sort of thing. You know, back in the 60s, there was a significant concern of, that American children were, were becoming fat and out of shape. And there was a national plan, you know, the president's physical fitness plan to get young kids out and exercising. Dimitri uh, Dasalakis from the CDC asks, you know, if we could say this is a plan that we need to do at a national level, what, we, what could we do as a nation to decrease frailty among elders, you know, like at a national level? Yeah, you know, Dimitri, such a great question. Um, and from somebody who actually has the power to do something about that, wow, <laughs> wow, so what an opportunity. Um, I do think national leadership on some of these things makes a difference. You know, showing my age, I remember President Kennedy's plan. And personally, I got a new pair of tennis shoes out of it because I was so excited and, uh, you know, to, to start doing some exercise. But I do think, first of all, people aren't very aware of this connection with frailty. And, and I think there's so many other reasons for people to begin to be more physically active. I think it would make a real impact to have national leadership on this sort of uh, program, um, which now we have many more tools than we had back in the Kennedy days. We have apps, we have you know internet um, capability, we have social media. So I, I think getting people in the mindset of doing incremental increase in their activity is really important. Um, I start out with people and say, look, you do not have to exercise for an hour a day. Some people are so put off because they feel guilty because they're not going to the gym for an hour a day. So they don't do anything. So we talk about, you know, if you go outside and walk for five minutes and come back in for five minutes and 10 minutes is more than you're doing now, that's great. Do it three times a week. So use this incremental approach so that people begin to get in a habit, so they build some habits. So, you know, I, I think that having, um, raising it up to a national spotlight in and of itself does some things. I think it would be very important for people with HIV and also to tie into the comorbidities that we are seeing. Um, and, you know, this is really where we spend most of our time for people who are successful on their antiretroviral therapy. It's really about 
you know, how can we prevent and manage these comorbidities? And, and more and more, I think physical activity is, is one of the most important things we can do. And so thank you for that yeah. question. And, and if I could happy just to talk with you about add it. to what you said, you know, we're an HIV specific group here, but frailty is a national phenomenon also, right? It's worse in people with HIV in many areas. You know, I had a friend who had a stroke and like many people who have a stroke, he didn't know what he was having, but his friends and family members had gotten the national you know, mm. education about recognizing strokes. Yeah. I think that if we had a national program to teach children and adult children primarily about recognizing when your parent or loved one is becoming frail, you know, at an early stage and so that they are supportive of the you know, balance exercises and the other interventions that you mentioned, I think that could also make it a difference. I think that's a great idea. And maybe one of your children will buy you an Apple Watch. Yeah, one of them already did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Melanie. That brings us to the end of our question and answer period. And we will resume at 1.10 for the remainder of the session today. Thank you.